Today we're going to discuss dimensional analysis. Uh, the key to din dimensional analysis is this sort of obvious statement that your answer cannot depend upon the system of units that you choose. Units are something that are man-made. Uh, we select what we want to call a kilogram or a meter or a second, and therefore physical results cannot depend upon uh, those quantities. And so we'll give several examples here, but that's basically the key to dimensional analysis. So in what proceeds here, we're going to distinguish between a few things, what we call fundamental units and derived. Now this distinction is a little bit arbitrary, but what I'll refer to is the fundamental units are mass, length, and time. Because we can't, they're all independent of each other. Something has mass, which I'll denote by brackets and an M to be the unit of mass. I'm not going to specify that our mass is in kilograms or pounds or grams, but we'll just use M, L, and T to denote mass, length, and time. An example of a derived unit from these would be force, ML over T squared, mass times acceleration. Now, of course, this distinction between fundamental and derived is a little bit arbitrary. I could move force up here and mass down here, for example. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. But I find it easiest to think of mass, length, and time as our fundamental ones and everything else derived. Uh, these units here will be sufficient for problems in mechanics. For thermal problems, we might need to think about temperature, but let me hold off on that discussion for now. So the key result that we're going to use in dimensional analysis is something known as the Buckingham Pi Theorem. And the Buckingham Pi Theorem states that if a problem has n parameters expressed in r independent dimensions, then there's n minus r dimensional parameters that really matter for the problem. Uh, it's difficult to understand what this uh, statement means, so I'm going to, have to show you several examples, and by the end you'll sort of get it. Let's start with a simple pendulum. This is the first example everybody does in dimensional analysis, so uh, let's not be original. So we're going to have a mass m hanging on a strength of length l, initially pulled back an angle theta naught, and then gravity will be pointing downwards. So I'm going to pull this back, I'm going to let it go, and we're going to ask the simple question, what's the period? So the way I'm going to proceed using dimensional analysis is I'm going to write out all the parameters in the, in the problem, and I'm going to start with a thing that we want to know, so the period. So I'm going to denote that as the time that it takes to complete one string swing, having units of t. So I'm going to write out a little table. So here's the thing we want to know. Then I'm going to list all the parameters that the problem depends upon and their units. So we have the parameters mass, gravity, length, and initial angle. These have the units that I've written here. And for initial angle, uh, I've written none because the initial angle will be measured in radians, which is already a dimensionless quantity. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to proceed and I'm going to eliminate uh, the, the different units. So I'm going to eliminate mass, length, and time from the problem just by sort of forming ratios or products of different parameters. So let me just show you how it proceeds. So I'll write out here for each row, eliminate, and we'll start with M. So I'm going to eliminate mass from the problem. Now this is kind of a little bit of a tricky one because there's only one parameter that has the units of mass in it, right? There's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, only the mass M. So that tells us something quite simple right from the start, which you might have already guessed or known, which is the mass of the pendulum does not influence the period. And we can see that simply from the units because there's no way for me to remove m from the problem. Cool. So we've gotten rid of one parameter. Okay, so now we're down to four things. The period as a function of gravity, length, and initial angle. Let's eliminate length. So I can form the ratio g over l, which would have units 1 over t squared. I remove L from the table. And now I've removed length from the problem. Now let's eliminate t. And now I have sort of choices of the way I can write this. But what I'll choose to do is write t squared g over L. And that has no units. So what the dimensional analysis tells me is that the parameter t squared g over L is some function of the initial angle theta naught. So this has reduced the problem quite significantly because before I had one, two, three, four, five parameters expressed in one, two, three, three dimensions. So that tells me there's two dimensionless parameters, this and this. Now the, the analysis doesn't tell us what this function is. That had to come from experiment or some other analysis, but it tells us that these two things are related. If the initial angle was always the same, so I always pulled it back, say to like 45 degrees, then that would tell me 
that t squared g over l is a constant. We don't know what this constant is from our dimensional analysis, but we know it would just be a constant. Or we could write that as t is some constant that we don't know is a function is equal to the square root of l over g. So a result you might seem familiar. And we came about this result here that things ought to vary as l over g simply by considering the units of the problem and eliminating things to this table. Um, what we observe experimentally what this means, if I take a pendulum and I make it four times as long, it ought to have twice the period. Okay, so we just did dimensional analysis on this problem where I said that the, the period is a function of the length, the mass, gravity, and the initial angle, and we figured out what that was. Except I sort of glossed over one detail, which is how do we know what are the parameters? Isn't it possible the period also depends upon friction at the pivot point? air resistance, the mass of the string, the diameter of the string, the material that the string is made out of, maybe the size of this. How do we know initially that it was just G, L, M, and theta naught? Well, this is the real trick of dimensional analysis and one that I think is glossed over in a lot of textbooks is they just present the procedure but they forget to, real, to mention that it takes real physical insight to know what the proper parameters are. And so the real trick to using dimensional analysis is to know which of these things we can safely neglect and which ones we can't in kind of being able to say, okay, well, let's just make an assumption. Let's assume these parameters don't matter. Let's see where that leads us. We'll conduct an experiment and see if reality uh, is matched with that. These are kind of the ways that we'll use dimensional analysis in the course. But for now, we're going to focus mainly on the procedure. But I want you to remember in the back of your mind that dimensional analysis is hard, not because the procedure of eliminating the units from the problem is difficult, but because knowing what parameters to include in your model and which to uh, ignore is really the thing that's really actually quite challenging. So this will be one where you'll start to note that you actually have to know some physics to actually get anywhere. So let's consider I have a sphere of diameter d moving through a fluid at, with a velocity u. The fluid has a density rho and a viscosity mu. Now, we haven't talked too much about fluids yet in any of these lectures, but uh, we'll learn later that these are really the two parameters that matter in what's called a Newtonian fluid. And why only these two parameters matter and not, oh, say, the surface tension of the fluid, the speed of sound uh, in the fluid, or all sorts of other things, is again, going back to this point that when you do dimensional analysis, knowing which parameters to include and which not to is really the key. So now we're just going to sort of focus on the procedure, and I'm just going to tell you these are the parameters that matter. Uh, so let's just do the procedure. Actually, let's do something else first. Let's count. So we want to know the drag force, and it's going to be a function of diameter, velocity, density, and viscosity. So we have one, two, three, four, five things, five parameters expressed in three dimensions because we're going to find these have ma only mass, length, and time. So the pi theorem should tell us that there should be two parameters left when we're done. So now let's write out our table. So now we haven't discussed uh, viscosity much, but it has units of m, l over t. So now we're going to do the elimination. You can start with anything you like. I'm going to start with m. We see that we have m here, here, and here. So I'm allowed to sort of form any ratio I want. So I can divide the force by the density or the viscosity, which you choose is essentially arbitrary at this point. Uh, I'm going to pick one, but that's, this isn't necessarily the right or the wrong answer. We could pick uh, the other one. But I'm going to divide the force by the density. And if I look carefully at the units, what that will give me is something length to the fourth over time. That doesn't have mass in it, so I'm just going to drop it down. That doesn't have mass in it, so I'm going to drop it down. And now I could form a ratio here as either u over rho or rho over u. Uh, I don't care what you do. I'm going to do mu over rho. And that will give me something, if I look at it carefully, length squared over time. All right, so we got rid of mass from the problem. Now let's get rid of time. So I see I've got time here, here, and here. So again, I have sort of choices in the way I want to do it. I could move this thing over here to eliminate time. I can move the velocity. I'm going to do uh, the velocity. And actually, as I look at this, uh, you might have noticed I made a mistake. So this is uh, something else important about dimensional analysis. So you need to be careful. So that should be a time squared. 
Okay, so now let's move the velocity over here, which to get rid of time, I have to use u squared, and that leaves me something that has units of length squared. And I'm gonna divide by the velocity over here, so I'm gonna remove it from our list and write. So now I only have parameters that have length in it, so the only choice now is to eliminate length. And the result I'm left with is that the force divided by rho u squared d squared is some function of rho u d over mu. Now our table gave us the inverse of that, but I wrote it this way because this is the most popular parameter in all of fluid mechanics. It has a special name, it's known as the Reynolds number, we'll talk about it quite a bit. And if you think about this result for a minute, it's actually quite remarkable. Because what it tells us is that we had this sort of complicated problem where in general, if we wanted the drag force, I might have to consider spheres of different sizes, moving at different velocities, moving through different fluids. But now we, we see that it, all the experiments collapse to a single master curve. So I just need to do one set of experiments with one ball at maybe a set of speeds, and I would capture all the data on a single master curve. Now it turns out this master curve, meaning this function right here, is actually quite complicated. It's very hard to know what it would be uh, from any sort of theory, even though it is possible, uh, it turns out to be an easy thing to do experimentally. It's observed experimentally is that if we plot this parameter, which actually we would call the drag coefficient as a function of the Reynolds number on a log scale, we see sort of two regimes. One is we see this slope, which is uh, proportional to one over the Reynolds number. That will kind of tail off and then it intersects with another curve that is relatively flat. So we get we have a regime where it's actually quite constant with Reynolds number and it'll kind of transition from one to the other. And then when we get out to sort of uh, further, and again, this is a logarithmic scale, so this transition might happen somewhere around a Reynolds number of 10, somewhere out here, maybe around 10 to the fifth. There's this kind of funky dip and kind of some funkiness that happens out here which is something that actually would be very hard to predict uh, a priori, but it's something that shows up quite clearly in the experiments. And so what's cool though, is we've got this master curve. So we can find this curve once experimentally, and then we can use it for all experiments that we might wanna do uh, between now and time immemorial.